Hi, this is Misha. And we were thinking about a 9mm stick in the range bag today, so we thought we would take this one out. We've never showed this being fired before, although we've definitely done videos on this gun here. This is a Canadian Inglis. Number one, Mark I Star, for what it's worth. High power type pistol in 9mm, 9x19 Parabellum Luger. Along with its original Canadian holster stock. So we thought we'd take it out and uh, see how she shoots. High power. And it'll be held open. Huh? Well, there you have it, folks. This old girl did pretty dang well, considering it was built in 19... 44, 1945 is a military service gun. It shot modern Seller and Bellot SNB ammo pretty well. Shooting it with the stock is quite interesting. It doesn't really cut down on recoil because it goes right into your shoulder, and this is just a wood butt plate. But it does keep it more on target easier to aim that's why these had these tangent sights now we have a history video so I'm not really gonna go into that much but about 152 Thousand of these were manufactured in 1944-1945 by the John Inglis Company in Canada. The original contract was for this version here, called the Number One Mark One. The whole genesis was because of China. Inglis was going to manufacture Bryn guns for the Chinese, who were allied with Canada, Britain, America against the Japanese during that war and they originally had ordered stocked high powers from FN in Belgium but the Nazis overran them before the delivery could be made so even though Inglis had never made a pistol before they thought what the hey well we'll try it you know anything so throughout 1943 Actually, over in England, mostly at our, the Royal Small, excuse me, Royal Small Arms Factory Enfield, they worked on reverse engineering the P-35 high power, eventually getting assistance from Dudenev Siv and others from FN who were in the UK under exile because of again Nazis. There were some various disagreements over royalties, yada yada yada. But it wasn't long before, towards the end of the year, an agreement was reached. FN would be paid a certain amount of royalty, and Inglis agreed not to manufacture over a quarter million pistols. So China placed an initial order for 180,000. They tooled up. The first couple of prototypes were made over in England. Then they were sent along with drawings and everything to Inglis. They set up the production line. Fast forward, fast forward, by February, the first Chinese contract guns were re ready. And by March, there were some contract guns for the Allies. During this whole process, remember that Britain and Canada were still issuing various revolvers as standard issue. Well, the high power is a very cutting-edge pistol for its day and time. So they had placed an order for 50,000 pistols. And so the first of those intended for the Allies became ready a short time later. And throughout that year, they would manufacture them. Now over here is an original 
Inglis Magazine, marked J.I. It also has a kind of unique floor plate. This is a standard double stack single feed mag that the High Power used. One of its claims to fame. And a friend recently, last month, gave me this mag and this gun here. This is an extended mag. And I'm not really sure what he thought it was. I, I guess it's Belgian. Looks like it holds about 20 rounds. A lot of these extended mags don't work so great. So, you know, let's, uh, let's throw this in and see how it shoots. Just because, why not? Plus, it looks really cool with the tangent sight stock and a long mag hanging out. Looks very machine pistol-y. Kind of a schneer fuel thing. <laughs> High power with the extended mag. Did it a lot better than I expected for an extended mag. <laughs> well there you have it. Surprisingly the extended mag actually worked well. No real issues. Well, no issues. So maybe it really is an FN. <laughs> Usually the aftermarkets are pretty rubbish. Well, the number one with the stock slot and the tangent sight was made for the Chinese contract. However, through various mishaps and misadventures and changing tides, and it was already 1944, not many were actually delivered to China. A large number ended up being acquired by Canada and Britain for use in their militaries. But they really didn't like the whole slotted pistol thing. So English would develop this version here. This is a English number 2 Mark 1. Well, Mark 1 star. No uh, stock slot, and a simple fixed rear sight. And this was made specifically for the Allies. Oh. So most of these went to the Allies, but still a lot of number ones did as well. Britain was very interested in this model. It was used by paratroopers, the SAS, other specialists, scouts. And this one here did go to Britain. That's why it has the Sunkerite paint finish. It was reworked there. These were actually officially adopted as a replacement for a lot of the old revolvers as the L9A1 in 1954. The original L9A1s would have mostly been Inglis high powers. Later they would go for Belgian high powers as old ones wore out and they needed new ones. One interesting thing about Britain when they refurbished guns, they weren't too particular about serials matching, so a lot of the British refurbed L9A1s will not have all matching numbers. This number one still has the original phosphate finish applied by Inglis. So it was probably used by the Canadian military. Grand total just a few well, tens of thousands ended up making into China, but it, it was kind of a slow process. Not that many ended up going over. They would end up doing about 60,000 number ones and about 92,000 number twos. With the final guns coming off the assembly line in September of 1945. So only about a year and a half production in Inglis. I mean, about, you know, September, obviously the war was over even in the Pacific, so makes sense. Very cool guns. I've always been a little more attracted to the Inglis high powers for some reason. I just like all the history that goes behind them and 
how these saw service. These weren't really ever commercial. They were always made for one military or another. Of course, during the war, some would end up being used by police or security guards, you know. But these were never primarily made for the civilian market. Because I know you guys like seeing holsters. This is the one that the number one came with. Not saying it's original, but it's what it came with along with the shoulder stock. And this is the one that the number two, the British one, came with. This one, as far as I know, is original. I mean, not to the 40s, but to that gun being issued later in Britain. So yeah, I just thought you'd enjoy seeing this pistol, the, a stocked high power, a legitimate one. This gun, this is perfectly legal. There are no, uh, there are no ramifications, no issues with the stock as long as you have a number one with an original stock. It doesn't have to serial match it. It just has to be an original. In fact, these weren't serialized to their guns as. I understand it. They only made about 29,000 shoulder stocks in Canada, and these were mostly subcontracted out because English did not do woodworking. So, yeah, 29,000 stocks and about 60,000 guns. So, you can, you can figure the ratio. But every two to one. They're pretty nice. Of course, everyone knows about the reproduction stocks. A good way to tell in my... I mean, you know, some of the repros are excellent. A lot of them have leather instead of the cloth gear. Also, a lot of the repros don't have the kind of... Um, I'm thinking of felt inside to cushion the pistol. And most importantly, the pistols tend to fit pretty loose inside. The repro stocks were as original as they fit almost too tight to be honest with you and of course the hardware one other thing are the screws repros tend to have round head screws whereas the originals have flat head and I don't mean that the slot I mean literally the heads are round on the repros and originals they tend to be very flush fitting screws and there's several different Generations of reproduction stocks. Some of them are very obvious to tell. Some of them are very, very close, even saying made in Canada on them. People like to make a big legal deal about them, but the ATF has never really cared. I mean, I'm sure if you had an obvious reproduction stock and you knew it, they might have something to say. But if it says made in Canada in good faith, you think it's original. These things have been around forever. In fact, an old ATF letter from the early 80s said reproduction stocks are fine. Then another letter from the late 90s, early 2000s said no, it has to be an original stock. But these are just opinion letters. These are not law. So keep that in mind. Neither one of those is ironclad. But the fact that these have been around for a long, long time and the ATF has never made a big deal about it seems to indicate they're fine with it as long as you're not being an idiot as always use your head use common sense don't break the law and usually if you're doing your part trying to be a law-abiding citizen they'll be respectful and leave you alone as well but a cool part of history Along with the broom handle Mauser, this is probably one of the most common stocked pistols you can find. At least not for crazy money. The whole putting a shoulder stock was a very, um, very common thing for a while, but after World War II, most manufacturers get away from it because it wasn't really that useful. And it's a very bulky holster, and they're only... So, so it being stocks. Anywho, I just thought I'd revisit this. For more on the history, you can check out our original video. 
Any questions or comments? If you'd like to share your own English high power, that'd be great. And if you could, check out the link to our Patreon page. This is Misha, and we will catch you next time.